Good morning. Welcome to Current. We are a community following Jesus together, and you're welcome wherever you are on your spiritual journey. A happy back to school week to many of our kids and teachers. There's a celebration going on in Current Kids right now. We hope the kids have a chance to mark this change in season together. In case you didn't see it in the email or on social, the coffee lounges are extra family friendly today and we hope that you'll pop in with kids or pets to say hi. As always, everyone is welcome in the lounge. You can find the entrance at bit.ly slash current coffee lounge. It opens at 9.15 or 10.45 a.m. every Sunday morning. Our team's been doing some work on our digital presence this summer, and it's so interesting. As we looked at Google data for July, we realized that there are still thousands of people finding us on search right now, and even some looking for physical directions on how to get to current. I'll be real, um, there's an immediate sense of loss when we look at that data, how many amazing people we haven't had a chance to meet in person, uh, to offer Phil's coffee to, to Together, but it also tells us that you're there and you friends. And uh, so thank you to those of you who have filled out connection cards uh, in the last few weeks or have joined us in the coffee lounge to say hi. I'm really grateful for the chance to get to know you and to get you connected to groups or to opportunities to serve. If you're new with us and haven't yet had a chance to fill out that connection card, we love whatever information you're comfortable with. It gives us a chance to be able to follow up with you. We are starting a new series today, Hope in 2020, and we're going to be looking ahead to fall a little bit together after the message today and what's coming up, um, ways that together we can mark the change in season and look forward expectantly to what God wants to do in and through us this fall. Uh, the wildfires this week are just one more way uh, this year that we are being reminded that we're not in control? Do we trust the God who is? Are we looking to him for hope? And what does that even look like? Let's go over to the band to fix our eyes on Jesus in song first together, and then David will be here with the message. We'll see you soon. Good morning, church. Let's sing together now. Here we go. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong dealing.
Sing this next song with me. A little old, but it does point to him, Jesus Christ, and his magnificence. And who compares to you? Who said the stars in their place? Father, first of all, our hearts go out to those who are impacted by these fires. Would you please watch over all those who are, are being displaced right now or are fearing that they will be? Please watch over and protect lives. Father, man, this is just so much uh, happening, even in the midst of so much happening. Uh, we need your help. We need your protection. Father, would your gospel and, and the hope of Christ just go out in the midst of these times? And would you use us toward those ends? 
Father, please bless this time now as we look at your word. Uh, would you please uh, uh, guide us and teach us? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome everybody. My name is David. Uh, when you're feeling down, what's something healthy you do to try to lift your spirits? Uh, you can even share in the chat bar if you'd like. It'd be fun to hear what people uh, do and, and learn from each other and different things that we can try. I know many of you have been uh, learning to cook or sharpening those skills during shelter in place. I want to try some of that food when this is all, all said and done. Uh, and Of course, many are watching Netflix right now. Subscription to Netflix has just skyrocketed since shelter in place began. Uh, maybe you go out on walks. Maybe you call a friend. Uh, something I love to do is read. And it's funny, it occurred to me the other day that what I've been reading almost exclusively since Shelter in Place began is fantasy. So Lord of the Rings type books, which if you've been around current for any length of time, you know I'll read that genre. But I read all sorts of, of genres of, of books, but I've been, you know, for the last few months during Shelter in Place reading fantasy and it occurred to me, oh my goodness, that's been my escape. You know, that's been my subconscious way of saying, I just you know, need to leave this world for a time and enter another world, enter someone else's problems, their, join their adventure, and just go along for the ride. Shelter in Place has been going on a lot longer than the vast majority of us ever anticipated. We are now in, in Santa Clara in day 166 of Shelter in Place. Day 166. Let that sink in for a moment. If you've been around since the beginning of these virtual gatherings that we've held, you know that in the beginning we used to announce, oh, hey, welcome to day such and such, and day number such and such, and we just, we'd celebrate it, even though shelter place has never been fun. It was just kind of a, hey, this is where we're at, interesting, woo-woo, you know, whatever. We stopped doing that, <laughs> and in great part because one of our leaders was like, hey, you know what? We've been at this for so long, it's beginning to feel like a bit of a downer when we highlight that. It was like, yeah, you know what? That's, that's right. Uh, we've been at this for a long time. And studies are showing that we are not coping all that well across the board. Addictions are skyrocketing. Depression is way up. People are suffering from mental health issues, often without even realizing it. People are struggling spiritually. There was a Barna study that came out recently saying that there's a finding that a lot of people who used to attend attend church regularly before shelter in place started are no longer attending and of those people who are no longer attending by the way that includes online services they're really struggling in a, in a myriad of different ways uh, whether we recognize it or not chances are all of what's going on right now is affecting us more than we realize so what can ground us in the midst of it all because as much as I love to read, as much as we love to learn to cook, as much as we love to watch you know, Netflix, go on walks, or whatever the case may be, all these things, as wonderful as they may be, are fleeting at best. But God gives us something that is so beautiful, so wonderful, and so helpful to help ground us in the midst of, of anything and everything. An unmovable, unshakable force, and that is he gives us his hope. That's the series we're gonna be getting into for the next couple of weeks. We're gonna be looking at God's hope. The series we're calling it A Hope in 2020 because we could all use a little bit of hope right now. As we consider our futures, as we think about our kids and their development, as we think about our living situations, our work situations, our relationships or lack of relationships we're longing for and on and on, we could all use hope. And God offers it as a beautiful and wonderful gift so freely. So how then do we grasp it? How then do we take hold of it? That's what we're going to look at today as we turn to Isaiah chapter 40. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 40. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. You can follow along on the screen. But we're looking at uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 through 31, a time in which the people of God really needed hope. Isaiah 40, starting in verse 21, says, Do you not know have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He, that is God, sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. 
He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will, we com- to, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these things? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each one of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Aren't these wonderful promises? That God gives us str- gives strength to the weary. Any of you feeling weary right now? That he increases the power of the weak. Any of you feeling weak right now? I love this thought that even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. Growing up, I was that classic boy athlete who just thought his body was invincible, that I could do and would be able to do anything and everything forever, (laughs) that my body would just work with all its strength and vitality. But boy, this side of an autoimmune condition, those days feel like a lifetime ago. But the promise here goes on to say, in a way beyond what we can experience in the strength and vitality of youth, when we put our hope in the Lord, he will renew our strength. This all sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But the question is, well, how? How do we take hold of this that God offers? How do we take hold of this hope and the promises of strength and renewal that come along with it? Well, in this text, I believe we see at least two ways that we can take hold of this hope that God offers so freely. First, we see that we need to learn to see the big picture. We need to learn to see the big picture. As I was reading the text, did you notice all these rhetorical questions that the author posited here? Look again at verse 21. It says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was formed? Then verse 25, To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. The author is exhorting God's people to lift up their eyes. In fact, that's what he even says here in verse 26. Literally, he says, lift up your eyes. He's saying, take a step back and, and get the big picture into you. This is something the people of God desperately needed at this time. Um, They were on the precipice of being conquered by the ancient Babylonians. For years and years and years, God had sent prophet after prophet saying, Turn back to me. Turn back to me in my way. Stop following after other gods, making for yourself idols and worshiping them. Stop oppressing people. Stop, t- you know, refusing to take care of the poor, overlooking the orphans, the widows, the foreigner among you. Turn back to me and care for these people that I call you to. And yet time and time again, they just refused to do so. And God said, you know what? I'm going to remove my favor from you if you don't turn back to me. And just look around you. There's all these warring people, all these conquering nations. Turn back to me or I'm going to remove my favor from you and you, or, or else you yourself will be conquered. Well, they didn't turn back. And eventually, the writing was on the wall here for them that they were going to be conquered, that they were going to be taken into exile which is worth letting sink in for a moment because everything that we face right now or that we are facing right now is no fun and in many ways is really scary and for some of you on the front lines it's especially so and but none of it compares to what the people of god were facing in this day i mean they were facing death they were facing captivity and yet notice the tone here It doesn't say here that God was just, you know what? I've just reached a boiling point and I'm done with you guys. I'm wiping my hands through. I'm I'm done. I'm I'm leaving you guys. I'm out. It doesn't say that. The tone instead is comfort, comfort for God's people, which is actually how the chapter, chapter 40 begins. God is saying, look, these actions of yours are bringing these things about for you, but I will never 
leave you. I'm not leaving you. And even though you're facing things that are really scary and circumstances that are really trying, I am here for you. You have my hope. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? God was saying to them, God is saying to us that no matter what we're facing, we need to lift up our eyes. We need to see the big picture. He sits enthroned. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy. Verse 26, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. That's the Lord. He's the everlasting God. Verse 28, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. And his, and his understanding, no one can fathom. That's saying at least two things here. It's saying, number one, that God's in control. That he created all things. Nothing slips his understanding or his grasp. It's not like COVID-19 just kind of happened without while he was off duty. You know, just kind of, oh, I got to figure out what to do now. No, he's in control. He's sovereign. The same is true, not just for world events, or, but, but also for, for our lives, for your life. The same one who brought forth each starry host one by one and knows each by name, knows your name. I love that thought because, man, if you ever get to see the sky when all its stars, I mean, there's so many, of course, up there that we haven't even begun to name all of them. And yet he knows each and every one of them. How much more does he know you? Does he know me? God is in control. But what's more, it's, uh, Isaiah is saying here that not only is God in control, he cares. Look at verse 27. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you ever complain like this? God, where are you at? You know, why is this happening to me? Don't you even care? I have on a number of occasions throughout my life, even though I know deep down, if you were to ask me, is God in control? Yes, he's in control. I still struggle at times and complain in these ways. Why? Because I've forgotten the bigger picture. I'm losing sight of what's happening. You know how those cartoon ostriches stick their heads in the sand? I, I learned this week that, that real ostriches don't actually do that. But in the cartoons, right, they all stick their heads in the sand. Whenever something scary is happening or they don't want to deal with something that's, that's around them, they just stick their heads in their sand. I feel like right now we're all tempted to feel that way and kind of live life that way, to just bury our heads in the sand. You know, this work situation that I'm facing is so hard, I don't know, I don't know how it's gonna work out, and so it just consumes you. And you just wanna put your head in the sand. Or, or that living situation, it's challenging, it's hard, you don't know how it's gonna work out, and it just consumes you, you just wanna bury your head in the sand. It's, it can be that way where we just become tunnel vision, where we just see only what's really in front of us, and where we forget to see the big, picture. And when we forget to see the big picture, we're only focused on what's right in front of us. It can easily lead to anxiety or depression or fear or worry. The author here is saying, lift up your eyes, see the big picture. God is in control and he cares. And in asking all these rhetorical questions, it's like he's saying, think for a minute. Look, see, consider. You know, Jesus taught something very similar in perhaps his most famous teaching of all in the Sermon on the Mount. He taught very famously, don't worry. But what I love is he didn't just say, don't worry, and then move on to the next thought. You know, just, hey, just don't worry. He told us how not to worry. He said, don't worry. He said, think. He said, look at the, at the birds in the air. Say if you're worried about where you're going to eat, what you're going to eat next. Like, look at the, the birds in the, of the air. Like, they don't know where they're going to get their food from, but God's taking care of them. How much more is he going to take care of you? And, and if you're worried, say about what you're going to wear. He says, consider, think, consider the lilies of the field. I mean, they, they're not spinning and toiling away, frustrated, like, you know, just stressed out of their mind. No, they're just going about their thing, and God clothes them in, in splendor far greater than just about anything else. How much more is he going to take care of you in this regard? Consider, think, look, and remember the big picture. Are any, of you, are any of you anxious right now? Any of you feeling worried or weary? Maybe, maybe some lack of, of, of hope? God invites you to lift your eyes, to ask yourself questions. Do, do we not know? 
Have we not understood that God's in control? He's in control over creation. He's in control over the rulers of the earth, it says here. He's in control of all things. And, he's, and so therefore, there's always hope, a hope unlike anything else this world knows. How can we know that he loves us and he cares for us even as he's in control, as if texts like these weren't enough? Well, if you just skip ahead to Isaiah chapter 50, 53, Isaiah just builds and builds and builds in terms of this promise here. I mean, it, by the time he gets to Isaiah chapter 53, God is like, hey, you want to know why you can put your hope and trust in me? Let me tell you what I'm getting ready to do for you. Now, Isaiah was written, the book of Isaiah was written in the 8th century before Christ. And in fact, because of this, um, these documents called the Dead Sea Scrolls that date hundreds of years before Christ in the Ohm Psalms, a copy, we have a, a complete copy essentially of the book of Isaiah. We know that these were, were written years and years, hundreds of years before Christ. And yet listen to what Isaiah 53 says in light of Christ to come. It says, who has believed our message? Again, starting out with a question. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off, from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressions. I mean, if that's not clearly about Jesus, I don't know what is. That he was pierced for our transgressions. That he bore our iniquities, our sins. For us, that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Going back to our text in Isaiah 40, he says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, and our redeemer. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. You can trust that God not only is in control, but he truly and deeply cares beyond what you and I could ever hope or imagine for, in that he gave us his son to die on the cross for our sins, to bring us back into relationship with him. That is the ultimate hope, the hope of Christ. And if you are here joining us today and you've never received this gospel or good news of Jesus message, if there's anything you hear today, I hope it's this, that you can begin a relationship with him today because of what he did for you on the cross. When you believe that God sent him into this world to die on the cross for your sins and that the Father raised him to life on the third day, and you confess that he is Lord, the scriptures tell us you will be saved. You will be brought into a relationship with him forever. There is no greater hope than that. And you can receive that today. Even now, we'd love to come alongside you and be a help to you in that. And then to those of you who have put your hope and faith in him, there's the wonderful hope right there for you. The power and strength that is right within your grasp and mine to just lift up our eyes and see the bigger picture. To, to look, to see, to think, to consider how he cares for us, how he is in control. So we need to first learn to see the big picture. But this text also shows us that we need to learn to wait. 
Uh, look again at verse 31. In the original it says, but those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Those who wait upon the Lord, it says here, will have their strength renewed. So we need to learn to wait. Uh, What does that mean? Well, waiting must mean at least three things. First, to wait means to obey. I mean, it has to mean that, right? If we're sitting in a waiting room trying to figure out what's next in life and trying to figure out, God, where where are you at in the midst of this? Waiting must mean continuing to follow after him and obeying what he calls us to, what we know he calls us to. Waiting is, is, is continually praying the prayer, thy will be done. Not my will, but thine. Elizabeth Elliot very famously said, the hardest thing to give in life is in. We can give this and we can give that. It's easy to give different things, but the hardest thing to give is in, especially giving up the right to determine how our life should be lived. Waiting means to obey. Waiting also means to to relax. You know, if God is really in control, then that means we can relax. I've heard it said, I don't know where I first heard this or or saw it uh, written, but it Uh, An author once talked about how Christians can very easily become practical atheists, he said. Uh, It's really easy to say, hey, you know, I believe in God, I believe that he's in control, but live as practical atheists. That means, man, I believe this, I think it's all all true and good, but when it comes out to living my life, well, I'm just going to try to figure things out on my own. But we are trying to be in control ourselves. If God is really who he is, and he really cares the way he does, then we have the immense freedom to just relax. In fact, whenever we worry or get anxious, what are we doing? What are we ultimately saying? But you know what? I need to be in control. I need to figure this out and get this all working together. Uh, Martin Luther very famously said to one of his friends, who's a very strong, strong strong-minded Christian, uh, who is always just wrestling with anxiety, a guy named Philip, Martin Luther very famously said to him, uh, let Philip cease to rule the world. That was his way of saying, Philip, hey, you don't have to have it all figured out. Do the best you can, faithfully following God, but he's going to work it out. It's not on you to figure out how things work are going to work out. And so when we do see God's control, we do see that he's caring and loving for us, it gives us the ability to say that I can relax. So waiting means to obey, it means to relax, and waiting means to expect. It means hope, of course. Because again, if what we're saying is true, that God is in control, and and he, He loves us and cares for us, it means He's ultimately bringing about good and healing into the world. I just love this thought. You know what we're talking about here today, friends? We're talking that God not only wants to offer you hope, which he does, and he he just gives it to you so freely if you just take hold of it. But he doesn't want to just stop there. He doesn't want to just bless you with hope. He wants to, through you, offer his hope to others. He wants you to join with him in offering it to others. We get to be a part of God's work in extending his hope, the hope of Christ, to those around us. There's an old John Newton hymn that goes like this. Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. For grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. We follow a big God. We should ask him and expect big things according to his will. I'm really excited about the next series we're going to get into come fall. I'm I'm really excited about the series we're in now. But the next series we're going to call, We're Still the Church, and remind ourselves of the mission and vision we have as a church, which is really exciting because our mission doesn't change with shelter in place. If anything, we're looking to step it up all the more because we have the hope of Christ that needs to be extended. So we need to learn to see the big picture. We need to learn to wait. One last thought and and then we're done here. Notice at the very end of our text, here in verse 31, it builds and builds and builds to this climax of these wonderful promises. It says, those who wait upon the Lord, they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Notice the order there. 
It's interesting, this whole text is building to these wonderful promises. But it says they will soar, they will run, then they will walk. Don't you think it would be the opposite? They will walk, then they'll run, then they'll soar? It's not that. They will soar, they will run, they will walk. And that's the point. Endurance is the point. Sometimes you will soar. Many times you will not, but you will always be able to walk. Some of you are really kicking yourselves. You're really down right now, down on yourselves, because you're just like, I'm just not feeling all of this. Maybe you're skeptical of these promises. Like, man, I just, I'm skeptical of this idea of soaring. Like, I, I want to feel that. I just, I just, it's just not in my grasp. Sometimes you will soar in life, but you will always be able to walk with God's help. And that's the point. He gives you the power to endure. We have all heard it said that life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. God is with you. He is for you. He is renewing your strength so that you can walk and not grow faint. So how can you take hold of this wonderful promise, this this hope that God so wonderfully, beautifully, and freely offers to you, even today, even this week? How can you learn to see the big picture, and how can you learn to wait upon the Lord? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these wonderful, wonderful promises. I'm reminded of of, uh, of a psalm when it says, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. Lord, you brought out the starry host one by one and know them by name. And just as much you know us and just as much and even more you love us, you care for us, even sending your son to die for us. We give you praise and we, we thank you. And if there's anyone here today who has never yet received what you've done for them on the cross, I pray that this would be their moment that you'd help them choose to put their faith in you even now and receive the hope of Christ that is forever in relationship with you. And for all those who have put their hope and faith in you, Lord, would you help us take hold of it more and more? Would you help us to take hold of it when anxiety stretches out towards us, fear, worry comes down on us? Would you help us not only even receive and be blessed by this hope, but would you also help us offer it freely to those around us because so many so desperately need you. We love you, Father. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's continue our time of worship now through song. All right, church, we sing this song with me now. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus.
Thank you, Chris, Julia. Thank you, David. We look forward to waiting on the Lord together as a church family this fall to obey, to expect, to hope in what He has in store for us. Let's continue our worship with the offering now. This is a time when we give God thanks and praise, where we worship Him with our resources, expressing that we trust His provision and desire to join Him in life-changing work and holding out hope. You can give online at currentsv.church give or by texting a dollar amount to 84321. There are a number of ways to get more involved this fall, to get more connected. There will be a fresh season of groups coming up and signups in a couple of weeks. And we also have another current pub trivia coming in early October, which is a way that we love to include friends into community with us. We want to invite you to save the date for Sunday, September 20th. We'll worship together online as usual in the morning. And then in the afternoon, there will be some time windows where you can uh, come drive by our office parking lot in Sunnyvale and pick up some fresh current swag, as well as community kits to share with friends, coworkers, neighbors. We're basically going to give you bags of goodies to give away that also contain invitations to interact with us online and to join us for our next pub trivia event in October. If you'd like to help with putting these kits together, please let us know and we'll put you in touch with Melanie, our connections lead. We also want to invite you to join us for a welcome lunch on Sunday, September 13th at 12 p.m., right after the second service. If you've never been to a welcome lunch, it's a chance to hear more about Current, our story, what we value together as a church family following Jesus here in the Silicon Valley, and just a chance to get to know one another better. It does take place over Zoom, but our awesome team will drop you a lunch to enjoy as we're online together. You can RSVP for this at bit.ly slash current lunch SEPT for September. That's what we've got for you today. We would love to know how we can be praying for you. Please uh, fill out that connection card or press the live prayer button to let us know. We love you, current family. Go in peace. We hope to see you soon.
Yes, it is.